Good afternoon once again from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. My name is Jeff Helgeson and today I'm talking about some members of a second generation of New World Romantics with a particularly American slant on the themes of their European influencers, especially William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. I'm speaking, of course, about a group of writers from the eastern United States who were chiefly centered around the town of Concord, Massachusetts, and active during the first half of the 1800s and later, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry David Thoreau, Louisa May Alcott, and then from the slightly distant city of Boston, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, as well as several others from the northeastern part of the United States. In a um, 2007 review that appeared in the Chicago Tribune book section when there still was such a thing in the city Sunday paper separate from arts and entertainment, regarding a book by Susan Cheever, writer John Cheever's daughter, titled American Bloomsbury, referencing a group of English intellectuals from more than a half century later, around the time of the First World War, that included Leonard and Virginia Woolf, philosopher Bertram Russell, E.M. Forrester, Lady Adeline Morell, and economist John Maynard Keynes, among others. Um, according to the reviewer, um, Art Winslow, Ms. Cheever characterized the community of literati in and around Concord during the first part of the 19th century as a patent place of sorts, thereby continuing a pattern of alluding forward in time to a 1956 novel and subsequent motion picture and TV soap opera, suggesting, as Wikipedia states, scandal and moral hypocrisy during the years surrounding World War II. Um, in the name of context for some of the writing that, in particular, came out of the town near the shores of Walden Pond, Winslow quotes Cheever as saying, The Thoreau brothers, John and Henry, <coughs> both lovered, loved Ellen Sewall, who rejected marriage proposals from each, and later, when he was living at the Emersons, Henry Thoreau fell in love with Lydian Emerson, Ralph Waldo's wife, after having done some flirting with her sister, Louise Jackson Brown. Hawthorne courted both Peabody sisters, Elizabeth and Sophia, after marrying Sophia, was intensely involved with Margaret Fuller while she and Emerson were exchanging love letters. Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women, who was also a neighbor, seems to have alternatively been in love with both Emerson, the intellectual, and Thoreau, the natural man. And this, of course, is not to even mention the um, personal life of Nathaniel Hawthorne's college classmate and friend, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in Boston, who published his first poem at the age of 12, was offered a college position teaching modern languages at 19, traveled to Europe where he remained for four years, and financially secure by the time he was 24 years old, essentially having it made, married, and three years later, began a tenured teaching job at Harvard, but then, on a second trip to Europe, following the premature birth of a child, his wife died. Later, Longfellow married a woman who was 15 years younger than himself, and over 18 years of marriage, they had five children together before, in a tragic accident, the second Mrs. Longfellow caught her dress on fire from a candle and died of her injuries, with her husband burying her on their wedding anniversary, but then continuing to write until his own death 21 years later, 
a sculpture of his head being installed within the poet's corner of London's Westminster Abbey. Now, notwithstanding these various circumstances, there remains the substantial body of writing that was produced along the way, with Emerson, both poetry and essays, with Thoreau, travel logs, political discussions of civil disobedience that would eventually influence Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and a generation of anti-Vietnam war protesters during the 1960s, as well as the chronicle of a kind of life experiment on the shore of Walden Pond. Then, too, there was the allegorically tinged fiction of Nathaniel Hawthorne, and the novels of Louisa May Alcott with Little Women, inspiring seven film adaptations, as many television versions, and an opera. And then, just for the sake of it, the wildly popular and largely critically acclaimed poetry of Longfellow from Boston, whose courtship of Miles Standish on one day in London sold as many as 10,000 copies, and whose Song of Hiawatha, just this past spring, was praised within the ultra-conservative U.S. newspaper, the Epic Times, as an inspiration for all true Americans. Um, to begin with Ralph Waldo Emerson, aside from what Susan Cheever describes as being the sugar daddy of American literature helping to pay for Thoreau's Harvard education and paying the rent for the Alcotts in addition to providing loans to the Hawthorns while they endured poverty, Emerson also wrote essays that, according to the article, remain foundational works in American literature and philosophy raising the ire of church and academy alike in staking out his beliefs that self-knowledge independently and individually arrived at is the root of moral and intellectual insight. Also, as the reviewer of Cheever's book points out, it is Emerson's Concord Hymn in which the embattled don't tread on me, American Revolutionary War farmer was described as having fired the shot heard round the world, which began the process of replacing aristocratic authoritarian rule with the idea of democracy among Caucasian landowning males at any rate. In keeping with today's concerns, relating to the balance between the consequence of human activity and the natural world, Emerson saw this relationship as absolutely primal, um, observing in a piece titled Nature that a transcendence of the material world can be experienced through observation of the natural world, which he felt to be the product of divine intelligent design. Expressing this notion, Emerson states, crossing a bare common in snow puddles at twilight under a clouded sky without having in my thoughts any occurrence of special good fortune, I have enjoyed a perfect exhilaration. I am glad to the brink of fear. In the woods, too, a man casts off his years as the snake his sloth, and at what period soever of life is always a child. In the woods is perpetual youth. Within these plantations of God, a decorum and sanctity reign, a perennial festival is dressed, and the guest sees not how he should tire of them in a thousand years. In the wood, we return to faith and reason. There, I feel that nothing can befall me in life, no disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot restore. Standing on the bare ground, my head 
bathed by the blight air and uplifted into infinite space, all mean egotism vanishes. I become a transparent eyeball. I am nothing. I see all. The currents of the universal being circle through me. I am part and or parcel of God. Essentially, William Wordsworth's love of nature for Emerson became what some trendy contemporary Japanese call forest bathing as a way to press beyond the material world and come to know the personality of God through experiencing the patterns evident within the environment which he was thought to have created. It's pretty much the testing of this hypothesis that sent Henry David Thoreau off into the woods at Walden Pond for a period of two years and two months beginning on July 4th in 1864, where, according to um, a Chicago Tribune magazine mention from uh, December of 1964, the author still received junk mail delivered to his Walden Pond address, including offers for home equity loans, financing for a swimming pool, magazine subscriptions, and a uh, Neiman Marcus charge card. As Henry David himself explained things, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life, living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms, and, if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole genuine meanness of it, and publish its meanness to the world, or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. Essentially, by eliminating all but the biological necessities, what Thoreau termed food, shelter, clothing, and fuel, he apparently wanted to see if he could um, simplify, 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 enough to free himself of the hindrances of acquiring unnecessary luxuries and therefore have the time to discover, both through reading great books and confronting nature at first hand, a living connection with the whole of the universe, transcending the particular to gain access to an unlimited awareness of the infinite, as in Williams Blake's to uh, see a world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. As for um, Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, according to the editor Malcolm Crowley in the introduction to the revised edition of the Portable Hawthorne, uh, following his college days in the company of uh, Longfellow, the author disappeared like a stone dropped into a well for a number of years before self-publishing a first novel and then in uh, 1830 beginning to try to create a New England type of legend like Washington Irving had done in New York along the Hudson River, having his stories brought out in the Salem Gazette before moving to Boston to become the editor of the American Magazine of Useful and Entertaining Knowledge. In um, 1837, 
Hawthorne's recollected stories were published as uh, Twice Told Tales and positively reviewed by his former classmate, Longfellow. A year later, and after almost becoming involved in a duel with the rival editor of the Democratic Review, Hawthorne became engaged to Sophia Amelia Peabody, marrying her three years later following a, a brief involvement in a uto utopian community, moved to Concord, and began what Crowley termed his most productive period as a writer, publishing the novels, or rather romances, as Hawthorne termed them, The Scarlet Letter in 1850, and then just a year later, The uh, House of Seven Gables. Within, within his introduction to the second of these two works, the author explained, when a writer calls his work a romance, it need hardly be observed that he wishes to claim a certain latitude, both as to its fashion and materials, which he would not have felt himself entitled to assume had he professed to be writing a novel. The latter form of composition is presumed to aim at a very minute fidelity, not merely to the possible, but to the probable, the ordinary course of man's experience. The former, while as a work of art, it must rigidly subject itself to laws, and while it sins unprobably uh, so far as it may swerve aside from the truth of human heart, this fairly right to present the truth under circumstance to a great extent of a writer's own choosing or creation, if he think fit also, he may so manage his atmospheric medium as to bring out or mellow the lights and deepen and enrich the shadows of the picture. Um, Hawthorne then uh, went on to, uh, two years later, be appointed as United States Consul to England, travel throughout France and Italy, and begin writing a book titled The Marble Fawn, Following that, with a preoccupation centered around what Malcolm Crawley termed the search for immortality, which would produce a work titled The Elixir of Life, before the author's own eventual death in 1864. The um, remaining literary resident of Concord, Louisa May Alcott, was both a feminist and an abolitionist, who began writing for the Atlantic monthly in 1860 before becoming a nurse at the Union Hospital with the beginning of the Civil War, her letters home serving as the basis of her first published book titled Hospital Sketches. She then began to write an anonymous series of gothic tales for a popular magazine publication grinding out as many as 33 that only began to be associated with her a century or so later before writing the somewhat autobiographical um, Little Women, um, eventually revising its central characters in more than three additional novels, Good Wives in 1869, Little Men in 1871, and Joe's Boys in 1886, ultimately dying of a stroke two days following the death of her father, in 1888. Now, notwithstanding the soap opera intrigues reported by Susan Cheever, it was from among the various Concord writers and their New England counterparts, such as Longfellow as well as William Cullen Bryan, that American literature began to become more personal and intense. Free expression of emotion became more common, and the intra personal psychological states of characters' minds began to emerge even while the nation itself expanded westward from sea to shining sea under the notion of manifest destiny and grew in its population from just over 7 million in the early 1800s to as many as 31 million before it then tore itself apart 
over the questions of state rights and the abolition of slavery some 60 years later, an issue that was advanced in the popular awareness by another work of fiction, Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by a woman from Connecticut in the early 1850s named Harriet Beecher Stowe, about whom President Abraham Lincoln, it's been said, had commented on meeting her. So this is the little lady who started this big war. Well, whether or not that is a truth or a fiction, it was the authors from the northeastern United States, and Concord in particular, who influenced the nation's conscience and helped to bring about a reckoning with the country's history that continues until today in one fashion or another, dividing liberals and conservatives and inspiring such slogans as America First and Black Lives Matter, and ultimately forging the identities of people who may have only a passing awareness of any of these writers and perhaps have never read a single word that they've written, yet are constantly influenced by the concepts they espoused and the experiences that they conveyed within their works. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.